don't know, my name is Dave Edwards. I've been at Riverside for about eight years and uh, just glad to be of service to the Lord. And I thank all of you for your support and your prayers along the way. Some of you know I'm going through a health challenge right now and trying to fight back this cancer enemy that's trying to consume my body. But we know that God has the victory, amen? amen. And I appreciate your prayers for it. And uh, just keep my wife and I in prayer because... Uh, God is working something special in us through this, through this trial, and I, I, I'm just embracing it and knowing that he's working it out, uh, able to get to work and uh, still enjoy life and be able to prepare for the word. So what else could there be? Amen. So this morning, um, I'll be plowing through 1 Peter 1, uh, chapter th- uh, verse 13 through 25, um, and just... Uh, you know, just ask God to open your hearts this morning to hear what thus saith the Lord. Let us just have a word of prayer first. God, we just thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor, O oh God. I ask you now, God, that you allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning, Lord. Let us feel your holy presence, O oh God. I ask you to fill this temple with your glory, God. That your word would go forth as gold, O oh God, and fall on fertile soil, O oh God. The band has already prepared the way, God. They, they've toiled the soil, O oh God. So just plant your seed in our hearts, God, that we would hear what thus saith the Lord. And God, as your willing servant, move me aside, Lord. Let them see only you, God. Only hear only your voice, O oh God. And we will give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise. And let this word burn in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, we say amen. Amen. So last week. Keith uh, shared with us uh, in his first half of Peter about rejoicing in our trials. He reminded us that our trials come to test our faith and build character. He reminded us us to walk with joy in our hearts regardless of what we were going through. And because of the hope that we have, the hope is in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us. You see, last week Keith told us that, you know, no matter what we're going through, that we should rejoice in the storms. And because of our faith in Jesus Christ and the resurrection, we should find joy in the fact that we just have eternal life. And no matter what happens in our life, we should be excited about our inheritance. We should be excited about our home in heaven and that we should be excited about what Christ is doing in our lives. And although we are children in exile and going through something, we have a hope in Jesus. No matter what happens, we are saved by grace, born again to a living hope and filled with unspeakable joy. But I'm not going to preach this sermon this morning. But I do have a question for you. And the question is this. Is this where our journey ends? Is this where it stops? Is that all there is to it in terms of being a Christian to rest in joy and to rest in grace and to rest in our salvation and to sit back and be complacent and find joy in our tribulation? Yes, we're born again by the precious blood of Jesus. But should we rest comfortably in the fact that we're saved? Are we to become satisfied with our current state of grace? When we're disobedient, is it all right to say it's good because God knows my heart? When our tongues prick someone's spirit, should our response be, people know who I am, they'll get over it. See, God's word this morning comes to remind us that being saved is only part of the journey. Being saved is only the beginning and not the end. Being saved is just the starting place for a glorious life in Jesus. Today's sermon is titled, Moving Beyond Our Salvation. You see, being saved equips us for the work that God has set before us. But once you've signed up for Jesus, we belong to him and we're here as representatives. And he has work for us. And that work is to bring him glory. You see, sometimes in this journey, unfortunately, after salvation, many of us get to a point in life where we find ourselves parked in neutral. No longer growing in Christ. Not pursuing Christ. And the world sees us idling, settling complacency, wondering what has happened to the fire that was in us before, wondering what happened to the joy 
wondering how come we're not shining our light to the community. We were saved, and many of us, when we experienced salvation, we were just on fire for God. Somewhere along the way, we settled back and got comfortable. I remember when I came to Riverside eight years ago, I was saved, but my life was a mess. My finances were a disaster because of poor stewardship, and my marriage was on the rocks because of my bad behavior. And my workplace was so toxic I could barely breathe. So when I came to Riverside, I was content. I was content to sit right where you're sitting and just settle into grace and mercy. I was content to sit there and say, God, at least I'm saved. There's nothing else left in my life, but at least I'm saved. I had allowed my trials and my tribulations and my shame and my guilt to steal my joy. I had allowed my failures to put out the flame in my life. I was saved, but I was stuck and neutral. But the Word of God spoke to me. He spoke to my heart. I sat here in Riverside, and the Word started to pierce the veil that the enemy tried to put over me. And God said, I'm not done with you yet. There's still much work to get done. Don't waste the precious blood of my son by sitting in the pews. I won't let you sit there any longer. He said, pursue me and show your light to the world. Saints of Riverside, the light of the ambassadors of Christ is growing dimmer every day. It's getting harder to distinguish his children from children of the world. It's getting harder to know that we're making a difference in this world. What has happened to our light? What is happening to the saints of God being called a peculiar people? Something as simple as celebrating the Sabbath, willing to sit one day aside for God. But he said, Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, but it's not holy. It's a holiday, not a holy day. We are saved and born again, redeemed by the blood, benefactors of the good news, children of the resurrected Christ, our sins bought and paid for. But what else is required of us beyond that? Is that all there is to being a child of God? No, family. No, that's not all there is. There's more beyond our salvation. Let me read what Peter says in the second half of chapter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed for the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Having purified your souls by our, your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly with a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of God remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Peter starts this passage by saying, therefore, therefore, because of, 
as a result of who you are in Christ, children of the Most High, being born again believers, and because we are so honored, our work is not over yet. It doesn't end with salvation. And just because we're in a state of grace does not mean that we are in a place of rest. You see, Peter says, therefore, Prepare your minds for action, meaning don't rest in your salvation. Get ready for warfare. Get ready for God to change your life. Get ready for his glory to be manifested in you. You see, we're, we're on a journey, and we have a race to win and a battle to fight and a great work to do for the Lord. Living the way Christ wants, to live, wants us to live means we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and get in the fight confront the enemy on his terms, and put on some new clothes. Take off the grave clothes. Peter says in this text, be sober-minded. That means take captive of your thought life, no longer allowing ourselves to be under the influence of other people, other idols, or other substances, but self-controlled and self-disciplined, guided only by the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, 8 says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You see, the enemy knows he can attack us through our minds, and we have to guard our hearts and our minds. We can no longer be easily moved by every wind and doctrine but be sober and aware of all the spiritual challenges that we face. Always on guard about what we think, what we watch, what we wear, how we conduct business. Always acting with modesty and humility. And through it all, keeping our hope in the grace that Christ has poured out to us. The grace that covers our imperfections as we press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The race is not over yet. There's much work to get done. We're saved, but God is not finished with us yet. We can't rest in that place when God wants us to be a light to this dying world. Peter says in verse 14, as obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So if we claim to be his, if we claim to love him, if we claim that we, we love the Lord, then we should want to obey him. You see, another way to say it is once we know better, God expects us to do better. Not in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. You see, not in our own strength, not in our own flesh, can we heal the pain of, of sexual abuse? Not in our own strength, not in our own flesh, can we heal the pain of emotional betrayal? Not in our own strength, can we overcome self-centeredness? Not in our own strength, can we overcome our self-righteousness and our pride, our envy and our jealousy? But Peter says, Peter says, therefore, Therefore, meaning because we are born again, because we are washed by the blood of Jesus, we no longer can be bound by our former passions. We are, we are not who we once were. And we now walk in power and authority, the authority of the Holy Spirit in us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, We are his new creation. Old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, we are no longer conformed to our past, bound by our pain, or shackled by our own mistakes that we've made in our life. Yes, there's some horrible things that we've done, but God said, through His grace and mercy, by the power of His Holy Spirit, we can rise above it. Because we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? You see, if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, then we can truly do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and we are truly born again, then no weapon 
formed against us will prosper. For greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Thus Peter tells us in verse 15, Be holy in all of your conduct just as the one who called you is holy. You see, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are the living Bible for the world to examine. We are, in some cases, the only Bible that people will ever see. We are the outward representation of what the good news should look like. So in every possible situation, we should pursue holiness in our conversations, in our civil affairs, in our homes, in our marriages, in our workplace. Pursue holiness. Holiness towards all people, our friends and our enemies alike. Riverside, we are called to be imitators of God by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Yes, this is a lofty calling. Yes, we are imperfect lumps of clay. Oh, but when we truly submit our hearts to the will of the Father and allow ourselves to be placed in the Master's hand, He and He alone will mold us and shape us into a holy image of God. So we can rest in that, knowing that we submit unto God's will. The Holy Spirit will do the work. In verse 17, Peter tells us, if we call on Him as Father, then we should conduct ourselves with fear during this time of exile. Fear of God is something that many of us sort of struggle with. We have confidence in the loving God. We uh, we reverence the almighty creator. But to fear him as a righteous judge makes us a little uneasy. Because we know that we're examined by him. We know that the Holy Spirit in us sees everything. We'd rather focus on the fact that we are converted by the blood of Jesus and sealed to eternity with Christ, but to Think about the fact that God is watching our every move and that the Holy Spirit sees everything. It can be weighty. Romans 2, 6 says this. God will examine all of our deeds. So it's much easier to think about the forgiving God and the loving God rather than reflect on the fact that one day We'll be standing face to face with the Almighty. And every thought, every word, and every deed will be revealed to him and to us. Peter may also have been focused on our life here, now, during this time of exile, from our true home in heaven. He may be focused on what we're going through now and asking us to walk in fear. Fear of what? Many of us go on this journey, we're thinking about God of love, but we don't fear the consequences of our disobedience. We don't really worry about if our behavior is displeasing to God, or even recognizing that the Holy Spirit is right here in the midst of all of our defiance, right here in the midst of our jealousy, right here in the midst of our envy, right here in the midst of all of our profanity, our bitterness, and our hatred. The Holy Spirit feels and sees it all. I'm just thankful that none of that exists here at Riverside. Yes, God is a God of love. But He's also a God of wrath. And we should fear God's discipline and His fatherly displeasure. God wants us to live a life of peace and hope, not one of despair and hopelessness. But what kind of father would he be if he did not discipline his children? In many ways, I feel as though this is part of what this country is going through right now. I feel like somewhere along the line, we've left our first love. And we forgot about the God of wrath. See, our nation's motto is, in God we trust. But I wonder if those words still ring true. You see, we are a nation divided. But most discouraging is that we, as the universal church of Christ, have allowed the enemy 
to come in and through our own selfish desires divided the church. Divided us on issues of human rights and civil liberties. Divided us on issues of gender equality and racial equality and standards of morality. The enemy has seeped in and caused division. But a house divided cannot stand. The church is a witness for Christ. But it's being overshadowed by the lack of unity and reconciliation of the body. Our light as a church is being consumed by the things of this world, dimmed by hatred and bitterness. It's starting to feel like it's more about what is in it for me versus what's in it for God. Romans 12 says, though we are many, we are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. You see, we are all joined together by the power of the Holy Spirit of God and we are all one family under God. We as the body of Christ have been saved for such a time as this to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 5, 13 through 15, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its taste. How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and gives light to the whole house. We are to give light to the whole world. We are to give light to the whole community of Hatboro Horsham. We are the salt and the light of the earth. But we have to come together in unity, church, so that they see what God really looks like. Isaiah 1.18 says this. It says, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall become like wool. You see, we, the church, can be the example for the world. All members of one body coming together to show the love of Christ to a dying place. Riverside, our salvation is only the beginning and not the end. Our country, our community, all need to be lit up by the light of Jesus Christ that brought us out of the grave. We need to move and act beyond our salvation with fear of disappointing the one that called us out of darkness. He paid a heavy price for us. He ransomed his son for us. The precious blood of Jesus covers us. We should be more than happy to live a godly life for the one that brought us up out of the dirt. Generational curses of the forefathers have been lifted, not by silver or gold but by the blood of the Lamb without spot or blemish. Let me finish with this one last point in verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly, with a pure heart. Love one another earnestly with a pure heart. In other words, Peter is saying again, therefore, therefore, because you believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, because Christ redeems your souls from hell, because you are born again, restored back to a right relationship with God, because your souls have been cleansed, Love one another with a pure heart. John 13, 34 says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. God has equipped us to love each other beyond our ability. 
He's given us the Holy Spirit inside of us to help us move beyond our own capacity. And because of the love that he's shown us, we cannot withhold our love from anyone else. He loved us through our mess. He loved us when we rejected him. He loved us when we wouldn't love him back. He loved us when nobody else would love us. He loved us with every nail in his hand. He loved us with every nail in his foot. He loved us with the wounds in his side. He loved us with his last breath on the cross. Can we love like that? Church, can we love like that? God has equipped us to love like that. The world needs to feel the love like that. And yes, we can love like that when we move beyond our salvation, when we move out of our comfort zone, when we start to pursue holiness, we can love like that. When we're willing to take action, and not sit complacent and do something with what God has blessed us with, our gifts and talents to put them in work in the church, in the fields. We must be sober-minded and guard our thoughts. Not be conformed by the things of the past. No longer bound by what our fathers and mothers put on us. No longer bound by what society has put on us. We are new creatures in Christ, and therefore that old man is dead. The word says, be holy as the one who saved you is holy. We must pursue holiness. There is no in-between. The world is watching. They want to see what Christ looks like. They want to know that Christ is real, and only we can show that picture. Conduct ourselves with fear and reverence. And love the same way that Christ loved us. This morning, I challenge us to move beyond our salvation, to move outside of grace and mercy, to press forward to the mark of the prize of God, which is truly our calling to be more like him. Hapro Horsham needs us to do that. Right here in this church, we can be the beacon to all the opioid addiction that's going on around us. We can be the ones to say there's hope in Christ. We just have to be willing to step out. Step out of our comfort zone and say, God, use me. I'm tired of sitting in the pews. I'm tired of sitting back. I'm tired of watching things. God, use me. So this morning, just meditate on that. God, I want to move beyond my salvation. I want to do something for you that is unique to me. He's given you all gifts and talents. He's he's positioned you to, to do great things for him. Just say yes to Jesus. Just say yes to Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. the band would come up. Maybe this morning there's somebody that doesn't know this Jesus I'm talking about. Maybe there's someone this morning that has never accepted Christ as their Savior. Still struggling with maybe they're not good enough. Maybe they're not ready enough. Maybe they don't have what it takes. Trust me. Come as you are. He said, come as you are. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for those that need him.